All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Sounds kind of funny saying that, and that I'm not there. I'm three time zones away, and it's uh, 3.30 where I am. But hello. And um, welcome to the March general membership meeting for the Council of Fort Lauderdale Civic Associations. We're going to do things a little bit differently, and um, I'm going to start right off with letting uh, Christina Curry, our first vice president, uh, do um, explain the new roll call procedures and just a few other things. So, Christina, go right ahead. Thanks. Okay. Good evening, everybody. So I know that you all remember that when we were in person, what would happen was we would do a roll call of the association, and then you would say hi here, and we would all get to hear your charming voices and your wonderful faces. Part of the point of that is that this organization is governed by bylaws, and you're not eligible to vote for an association unless you've been designated an association's rep or alt. So in order to make sure we're doing what people expect us to do, we're gonna switch up the roll call a little bit. So we're gonna to get to see your faces, know who's there. I'm gonna call out the association that I have on my list. And instead of saying here or hi, I need you to say your name so that I know if you're a designated rep or an alt. Just because you were a president doesn't mean that you were also the designated rep. So don't freak out on me. If it's not perfect, it's okay. Our quorum number is only 12.25. So we've got this. So I'll start now. Val Harbor HOA, a designated a rep, please state your name. No. Bermuda Riviera HOA, designated rep or alt, please state your name. Bill Getch, just a resident, not the designated rep. Okay. Beverly Heights Neighborhood Association. Do I have a rep or an alt? No. How about Birch Park Beach HOA? Central Beach Alliance. Central City Alliance. So Brown, resident, Central Beach Alliance. And then we have to update uh, our voting form. Okay, that's online, so you can do it online. Uh, Central City Alliance, it's non-voting, but you're welcome to tell us if you're here. No, okay. Coley Hammock HOA, rep or an alt? Please state your name. No. How about Coral Ridge Country Club Estates? Coral Ridge Association. I'm sorry, um, Coral Ridge is here. Abby is actually the uh, voting uh, delegate for Coral Ridge. Okay, can somebody please ask Ed Rebholtz to shop, stop sharing his screen? Um, I I will... Coral Ridge oh, Isles you? HOA. Rick Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Rick. Coral Shore Civic Association. Versant Park Civic Association. Michelle De Maria. Thank you. Dolphin Isles HOA. Downtown Fort Lauderdale. Melinda, I see you, right? Melinda Bacher here. Edgewood Civic Association. Flagler Village Civic Association. Gold Mile Community Association. Oh, I'm uh, Marsha Rothenberg. Hi, Marsha. Thank you. Hi. Harbordale Civic Association. Present. Thank you, Marilyn. Harbor Beach Property Owners. Ed Revolts here. Harbor Beach. Okay. Um, I'll get to you in a second, but thanks, Ed. Harbor Beach Property okay. Owners. Harbor Inlet Association. Historic Dorsey River Bend. Yes, Michelle Jenkins, I'm the alternate. Thank you, Michelle, I got you. Home Beautiful Park Civic Association. Oh, I think that's why here. Yeah, I'm thank you. Ida Wild. Ann Hilmer Rip. Thanks, Ann. Imperial Point, Betty, I saw you. Michael Albetta's not here for Lake Ridge. Landings Residential Association. Where's Michael? Landings Residential Association. No? Lauderdale Beach HOA. 
Cannon rep. Yeah. That, uh, so Helena, Helena Cooper Landings rep. I don't have you listed, Helena. We'll we'll touch base after. Landing. Got it, but I don't have you listed. We'll touch base after. Lauderdale Beach HOA. Uh, that was Steve Gannon rep and Barbie Pearson, uh, the alternate. Lauderdale Isle Civic Association. Earl Prisley uh, present, and we will update the uh, information. Great, that's online, Earl. Lauderdale Manors HOA. <laughs> Is somebody trying to speak from Lauderdale Manors? No. Melrose Manors HOA. Middle River. Colleen is here. Thanks, Colleen. Nermi Isles HOA. Palm Air Village. Donna, I think I saw you in the chat. Yes. Poinsettia Heights. We'll touch base on that later. Uh, points uh, James Lebrie, James Lebrie representing right, I don't, I don't have you listed as the rep, so we'll touch base later. Point, Point Sienna Park Civic Association. Progresso Village. Rio Vista, I'm here. River Garden Sweeting Estate. Riverland Preservation Society. River Oak Civic Association. Riverside Park. Rock Island. Sailboat Bend. Seven Isles. Shady Banks. Sunrise Intercoastal. Present. South Middle River. Uh, Lynn Morgan for the rep, uh, Jason, on the alternate tonight. No, you're you're the you're the designated rep, Lynn. I got you here. Thank you. Turpin River Civic Association. Victoria Park Civic Association. Yeah, Dan O'Connor here. Thanks, Dan. I got you here. Okay. Uh, any association that's here that wasn't mentioned and you think that you should be, can you unmute yourself and tell me your name? Hi, it's Michael Madfis. I'm I'm here with Flagler Village Civic Association. I also thought I saw Leanne Barber on, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, well, only one of you is eligible to vote, so I'm going to go ahead and mark you as present. Thank you, Michael. Anybody okay. else who didn't hear their name? Yes, Jim Brady or Coley Hammock. Coley Hammock. I see you here, Jim. I've updated that. Anybody else who didn't hear their name? Frankie Lane from Rock Island. Thank you, Frankie. I got you. Anybody else who didn't hear your association name? Uh, Marie McGinley, Central City Alliance. Okay, I don't have you as the designated person, but you're non-voting anyway, so I don't think it's gonna change anything. I'll get with you later to update that, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh-huh, anybody else? Did you get Ed Redbolt at the Waterdale Harbors? Yes, I got you. Okay. Y'all, I'm looking down at my paper, so you got to help me out with these folks typing, it, typing in the chat. So, Jana Gray, River Garden Sweeting Estate. I got you. All right. We have our quorum. Thank you. Okay. All right. Roll call the old fashioned way. Maybe one day we'll be able to do it in person pretty soon. But thank you, Christina. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Before we start our meeting, I just want to. Um, make it clear how we're going to do these meetings. We're going to have our guests and our speakers go first. That's going to be the first part of the meeting. And then when they are all finished, when every guest and speaker is finished, then we will get down to council business and um, we'll have you know discussions, any needed discussions about any of the speakers or any business that's going on. What I don't want to have um, is a discussion and a motion and more discussion while our speakers are, are you know present and and waiting you know to talk to us their time is precious so you can, certainly we're going to have time for questions but as far as council business and what um we discuss and any motions or any voting is going to happen after all the speakers have finished and the speakers you're more than welcome to stay on and uh, listen to any discussion um if you want to i would 
get off, but that's up to you. So um, with that said, I also want to say our city manager is uh, on our agenda, Chris Lagerbloom. He is in Washington, D.C., and he's probably going to call in if he can at 7.30. So um, I'll give him some questions that people had, and so hopefully we can get him on here, but there's always a possibility that he might not make it. So um, with that, we're going to have four people, I think I do believe they're all on here, um, to talk about the Broward Commuter Rail, actually they are the Broward Commuter Rail project team. And I've seen some of them already, maybe many of you have. Um, I think I've seen them twice since the uh, last general membership meeting. So for those of you who have not seen them, here's an opportunity mm -hmm. to catch what is being discussed about bridge or tunnel through this, our city and um, their names. And I think Phil might be the primary speaker. I could be wrong about that. We have Phil Schwab, who is the uh, Broward Commuter Rail Project Manager. Mike Cesar, I think that's how you say that name. He is the Broward Commuter Rail Consultant Project Manager. And Jamie Lopez, who is the Broward Commuter Rail Corridor Manager, and Lauren Hatchell, who is a Broward Commuter Rail Consultant Community Outreach. And I've been dealing mostly with Lauren getting this set up. So with that, um, we can go ahead. I, I, assuming that you guys have a presentation you might want to put up on screen, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct, Mary. I'm, I'm going to do that now. This is Phil. Uh, okay. But it says disabled share. So um, well, somebody's um, got to stop sharing for me to share. Okay, so Jim, if you could take down the, there we go. Okay, now you should okay. go ahead. Right, there we go. You got it? All right, uh, I know I think he slotted us for 10 or 15 minutes. I'll do my best to kind of get through this. Uh, we're gonna highlight a lot of different things uh, so that people are aware uh, and understand a little bit more of the alternatives. I'm hoping everybody has had a chance to get uh, uh, some information on the project. I know we're going around to different civic associations and, and some people haven't heard too much about it. Others uh, have been very active in it. So uh, when I'm through, I'd like to, you know, the team is here to answer any questions. We may have a few other people on the line, depending on how technical the questions get and how much detail uh, that we can help answer. So just real quick, I want to make, point out that, you know, the, the benefits of commuter rail is that we, we're providing additional transit options. It actually helps increase the overall transit viability, where more people use transit to get to stations uh, and utilize a commuter rail system. So it'll be helpful in that uh, essence. Uh, by in, in enhancing the quality of life, giving people ch choices, uh, you know, less time in the car, uh, more comfortable commutes, uh, better opportunities, potentially, depending on where they're going and what they want to do. Um, and it also helps promote the economic and, and, and residential growth that's that's occurring and, and, and we want to continue to grow. Uh, also, employers will have a, a better access to employees, uh, big, larger <laughs> pools of people uh, that they could uh, entice to come work for them. And then from an environmental standpoint, the more cars we bring off the road, uh, the better. Uh, and again, it just helps the overall transit, not only with commuter rail, but it helps to increase that uh, throughout the, the area. So the graphic you see on the right is, is Broward commuter rail. So at the bottom there, that circle, it says project um, limits. Uh, that's on the south end. That's actually in Dade County. That's Aventura. And uh, Miami-Dade is moving forward with a commuter rail project that goes from downtown up to the Aventura and they're actually building the station or having Brightline build a station there. So they'll have a joint uh, Brightline and commuter rail station. So we pick up there and we're gonna go up to Deerfield Beach and this corridor, this is the FEC corridor. Uh, so it's different than Tri-Rail. Tri-Rail is west of 95. This is the FEC that has the freight on it. It also has Brightline on it. This, this is the one that goes through uh, Fort Lauderdale. This is the corridor that, that we're going to have commuter rail or that we're studying commuter rail on. Uh, the DOT is leading the pd &E study and will lead the NEPA study, the environmental and, and, and technical analysis, but it's really a Broward County project. They're going to uh, develop and they're working on the finance plan to figure out what they can afford. Uh, we're providing some costs of the different, uh, different alternatives as well as the corridor in general. Um, 
and again, the corridor is 27 miles, and, and we have several stations that we've made recommendations on, actually six, and you see those in those white circles. Uh, the downtown station uh, is a bright line station, so we're gonna be sharing that. Uh, we have to expand the platform, and depending on alternatives, there's a big impact to the station, uh, but that would be a bright line. Uh, we also have a stop at the airport recommended. Uh, that is also planned to be a bright line station. And then the other ones uh, on the south would be Hollywood. And then for the, further north is Pompano and Oakland Park, and then ultimately Deerfield Beach. Um, so we've made those technical recommendations. They're not final. They would be part of a decision making that the county commission would do when it comes to a locally preferred alternative. So uh, that that's one component of it. And, and the biggest one, which I know everybody is anxious to hear more about, are the alternatives on how to cross the river. So we have four alternatives. There's actually three bridge alternatives, a low level and mid level bascule bridge. And a bascule bridge is just one that moves similar to the FPC uh, bridge that's out there now. It'll operate in the up position and then close when a train comes and then open back up again. We also have a fixed bridge, which will be high enough where it doesn't have a movable piece. It'll just be, a, uh, it won't have to stay up because all the boats can fit under it. And then of course a tunnel, uh, which boats have no problem with a tunnel because it's below them. So uh, just real quick, this is a, a view, uh, you know, lo looking, looking east from the west of the existing uh, bridge with a superimposed commuter rail bridge. So in the upper left is a low level bridge and this is in the up position. So you can see it's about 80 feet high. Uh, the bridge when it's closed will provide about a 20 foot, 25 foot opening. Uh, or vertical clearance underneath for boats uh, 25 foot or less to get under. Uh, since it's movable, this is a fairly large pier that would have to go in the water to help support all the mechanical um, mechanics that are needed to move the bridge up and down. On the right hand side is very similar looking, but this is a bridge that's 80 foot in there, or excuse me, 56 foot in there. This is the mid level. Uh, because it's not high enough, uh, there's still a, a, a number of boats that would have to have it open uh, but not many. It really supports about 99% of the boat, boat traffic, and I'll get into that in a minute. And then the fixed bridge, which is 80 foot, uh, that, that's remaining closed and it doesn't have the large bascule pier. And then the tunnel, uh, you can't see it from here because it's under the water. So, so this is just a picture of the existing bridge, but to give you an idea of what's happening here, uh, I'm gonna give you a, just a sketch, which is a section view where you're looking south. So the existing bridge that this is on, this, this bascule bridge, the foundation for that is on the left-hand side of this graphic. These are just piles that are, you know, through the water and into the, into the, the underneath the water, into the, the ground below. So we, we're gonna try and stay as close to that as we can, uh, but we'll have two tunnels uh, in order to get through there. So it's a wide footprint, but it's underground. So I'm going to go through, these are just some takeaways that I, I want everybody to be aware of for, for each of the alternatives. And in all of these alternatives, the freight will remain at grade. So it, it, it'll always run at grade. Uh, we, for the bridge alternatives, we are looking to shift the bridge a little bit to the east to make room. So our, we try and minimize some of the impacts uh, from a right of way perspective for the bridge alternatives. For the tunnel, uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, we won't have to shift it, but it's... Uh, I want to make you aware of that. And of course, the low level is the, the, the least cost when it comes to the, the capital costs. And it also requires no private right of way. It does require the closure of Southwest Fifth Street, which is just south of the river. Uh, we need to bring the bridge down and we can't fit the road under it and we can't go over it in order to make the geometry work. And again, uh, the, the train will come down before Broward Boulevard. So uh, I, I point that out because the other alternatives bypass or go over or under Broward Boulevard. So from a traffic perspective, that's a bonus for those other alternatives. And this will accommodate 90% of the boat traffic, but it does not accommodate the, the, the boat traffic that the marinas to the west cater to, which are boats larger than 25 feet. So about 80% of their clientele can't get through there, but they are about... 10%, those type of boats are about 10% of the boat traffic. So it will accommodate 90%. So it helps with boat congestion in general. 
So, and, and the bright line trains move off of the FEC line and they come up onto the new commuter line uh, bridge. So that, that's a the benefit just from a, a, for, for, for boats and as well. So this is the, the mid-level on the left and the fix on the right. They're just a little bit larger photos than I showed you on the other one. I do these together because the cost of these and the footprints of these are very similar. So the big difference is one has a bascular leaf and is 56 feet. The other one has a fixed bridge and 80 feet. Everything else is almost identical. So the, the costs are 452 for the high level and 444 for the mid-level. So another 200 million more than the low level. But these also have private right-of-way impacts up to almost $100 million. Both of these accommodate the navigation. The marina industry is happy with either one of these as well as the tunnel. Uh, they bypass a number of the, the intersections. So they bypass, they go over the road. So we're not sending a lot of trains through those local roads in there. And it also bypasses Broward Boulevard. And you'll see when I get to the tunnel slide, the tunnel actually goes under Davy Boulevard. So another bonus for that as far as avoiding some of that traffic. Uh, but again, in all these cases, the, uh, the freight is at grade uh, regardless of the alternative. Now for the tunnel perspective, uh, the graphic on the bottom left is a portal or a trench. This is where the tunnel has to come out of, uh, out of the ground and it comes out in a hole, basically a 40 foot, 35 foot hole. And this is just south of Andrews Avenue. That's where the portal will come out and it'll go under Andrews Avenue. This is the most costly of the alternatives with 1.8 billion for construction and 150 million in private right of way. Uh, we'll have a, a longer construction schedule uh, uh, and more lengthy permitting, but again, it bypasses Broward Boulevard as well as Davy Boulevards for passenger rail. Uh, so this has the bonus of, of bypassing Davy where the, the high and mid-level don't. And of course, between this portal, which is the north portal, and then there'll be a, a south portal where the tunnel comes up on the south. In between those portals in the downtown area, you won't see the 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 commuter line because it'll be underground but it does require an underground station just like the mid-level and high level bridges require an elevated station so right now the station's at grade uh, so in those alternatives it's either going to be elevated up in the air 50 60 feet or it's going to be in the ground uh 60 feet or so now i i bring up right away just to because i've like i said i've done some different uh, meeting. So I'm going to walk you through some of the right-of-way impacts, just so everybody's aware. Uh, this was asked at one of the civic association meetings, so I had the team put together a few slides to help illustrate this in, in a little better fashion. Um, so pro there's proposed right-of-way where we basically need full rights of the property. And then for the high-level and mid-level bridges, there'll be some of that, but there'll also be what we call an aerial easement, meaning that the bridge will... Uh, be up in the air 60 feet so it may overhang a property um, so that's called an aerial easement and for the tunnel at those portals we need a lot of private right away so there's that's full property rights that we need but in between those portals where the tunnel is underground we need an underground easement so there'll be some limitations to whatever the property is as far as how how much they can dig within their property but uh, we're, we're anticipating that their, their functions will be able to remain as, as it is. It may limit some of the stuff they can do in the future, depending on what they're planning, but that's uh, the general idea of the different right-of-way. And, and this is just for showing the parcels. So we have the, the alternatives over here. And, and uh, what I want to point out is where we need the full property rights. Uh, so we need some, we call them slivers or swaths, depending on which way you look at it. Uh, for the mid-level and high-level bridges, there's about 32 properties that are impacted, private properties, and for the tunnel, 58. And I'll show you that in a little bit greater detail. I'm going to start with the tunnel. This is just a schematic. Uh, like I had mentioned, the, the yellow shading, and let me just orient you real quick. Broward Boulevard is in the center here, and this is where Andrews Avenue goes, crosses the tracks, and the tracks are on a curve. And so you have Andrews, you have cis trunk right here, uh, just to the south of that portal, uh, where that blue is, that blue shading, this is the portal area. This is where you have an open trench, basically, to let the tunnel out so it can get up and, and get up to the same elevation as the tracks before it shifts over and connects to them. So this blue are, are, is area is where we need full property rights. 
And in the yellow, this would be underground easement. And then once we get up and have our portal to the south of Davie, that would be where we need full property rights in those areas. So we try and take advantage of as much of the FEC right away as possible, but there's gonna to have to be some additional ones for, for this particular alternative. This just gives you an illustration of what an underground easement could look like. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, we would protect uh, about 15 feet above uh, the top of the tunnels. And so this distance could vary quite a bit. Uh, depending on the location and the final profiles that we have for the tunnel. Um, but this takes about 70 foot uh, additional right away besides the FDC line in order to fit it in. This is a, a graphic at the portal. Uh, so we are looking to the south and you can see the freight track is remaining at grade. This is where the passenger rail will be coming up. They, the tunnel is done, but we have to come up and this is called a portal or a trench uh, as it comes up to grade. And then once it comes up to grade, then we slide it over and connect to the existing tracks. So in this area, sometimes we have um, a road like Progresso Drive that we have to relocate. And in order to relocate it, we have to purchase some additional right-of-way. So we need right-of-way to fit the portal as well as relocated road in some cases. So that's where the larger impact comes in sometimes when we're talking about the portal. And just to give you an idea of the footprint, uh, this is, if you look at the graphic to the uh, upper left, this is the schematic. So it's trying to show uh, just, just around Sunrise Boulevard uh, which you see here, uh, this is the area that I'm blowing up. So this is where progressive drive ties in and we have that uh, S curve. And this is the dangerous curve right now. And I know both the county and the city, everybody's looking to figure out how to improve on that. Um, hopefully they, they take care of that fairly soon. But as you can see, the portal, these red lines represent the new track lines that go in. This orange over here is a wall. And this is the relocated road. So it's a fairly significant right of way impact where it uh, affects more than one property uh, in those areas uh, in order to get all that in there properly. And if we just keep going to the south, you can see the bubbles moving along as we go. And I'm gonna go through this quick and I know it's a lot, but it just helps illustrate where these right of way impacts are coming from. So this is where Andrews Avenue, and if you recall from that rendering, Andrews Avenue is going over this trench area. And so this yellow is underground easement. Uh, so this is the South Florida, the auto recycling, and this is the Cistrunk Marketplace. To give you a frame of reference, here's Cistrunk Boulevard. And so again, we're relocating Progresso in order to fit our trench in here, uh, in order to make that connectivity happen, but it is damaging a, a number of parcels as we go. Now I'm gonna to jump to the south side of Davy Boulevard. Uh, so this is where the yellow where the tunnel comes up. And so this is the beginning of our portal or our trench. So this will be you know, a, deep, a deep cut in order to support the walls. And so this orange, and I know it's faint, this is walls that support the, uh, the trench as these red lines start coming up the grade and we have to relocate the road over here in order to keep everything connected. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that this just finishes it up and it ties in, still takes a little bit just to the south of 17th Street in order to tie all that in. Uh, and the right of way gets less as, as it gets closer to the existing tracks. So from a, uh, this is the high level and mid level uh, bridge uh, standpoint. So uh, around the new river, uh, we're pretty good about avoiding um, private right of way. We do need some aerial easements uh, just to the south of the river, but we're able to kind of stay within the FEC right away and the public right away uh, in that general area. But, you know, once, once we're kind of north of the station, that's where we start having some right of way impacts. And to give you an idea, here is where we've split the track. We need the two lines for the uh, passenger rail. So if it's aerial, uh, could end up being one or two bridges here. But the idea is that uh, we would try and take advantage of all the FEC right away that we could fit in, but we would require additional right away to fit our foundations in. And then above that, we would go for or, or uh, obtain aerial easements so that we could stay elevated 
uh, but not try and lessen our impact of properties versus take the property uh, and go with an aerial easement instead. And so that's what you see on the left. And we have about eight properties that we have this right away and aerial easement needed. Um, and then in other areas, it's mostly shifting the existing road that's out there to accommodate what we need for the passenger rail. And that's what you see over here. And so again, this is just north of Sunrise Boulevard in order to tie in. We need this sliver along the area from the property. And then as we go south of Sunrise Boulevard, it's a continuous sliver. Uh, most, a lot of times when we get in front of Progressive Drive, it's to show, not show, but place uh, Progressive Drive a little bit further to the west in order to accommodate what's needed to bring the bridge down. And here is where you can see the bridge ending. So it's just north of Andrews Avenue. And so this would be uh, MSC wall that helps support uh, the train tracks until it can get to the same elevation of the existing freight line. So Andrews Avenue is uh, on, the, on the right here. So we're going to be elevated above Andrews Avenue and then bring it down. But it requires this, this sliver. And I think it's uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet in areas uh, of what right of way might be needed to do this. And depending on what alternative is actually selected, we will work in the next phase of the project through the NEPA process to refine it and try and minimize and avoid right away. We'll continue to do that. We always do. Uh, so this is around the bend right at Cistrunk where there'll be additional right of way right over the Cistrunk marketplace uh, where this could potentially span that building, but it would be aerial above. So we'd work with the property owners to figure out the best way to do this and, 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 and that also impacts the park just to the south of that. And this is a, a, an area where we're impacting with the bridge. Uh, there's basketball courts, there's a, a, a swimming pool here as well. And this is the limits of the private right of way impacts. And then to the south of this, we're able to uh, stay within public right of way uh, down to the river. And now south of the river, uh, as you can see, we need some aerial easements um, in this area right here where the boat club is. And then we will work on and stay within the uh, public right of way, uh, accommodating uh, what's needed in this general area. We're also showing the Lauderdale Trail uh, in this area. This would be a proposed relocation to what uh, they're proposing. Uh, I'm not sure of the schedule uh, of when they're looking to construct. Uh, but this is by others, the Lauderdale Trail. Some are familiar with it, uh, where we would uh, have to relocate this if it's already built, or or they would have to look to go in this block versus the block right adjacent to the railroad here. Hey, Bill, are we? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just because I want to make sure people have if people have questions, we have time. Are we getting? Are you getting close to wrapping this up? This part. Yeah, yeah, this is the, uh, I've just got a few more and I'll blow through them pretty quick okay. and then we can stop, okay? All right, thanks. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so this just shows uh, uh, going to the south where there, there are right of way impacts, you know, to get the structures in, the pier foundations and, and an aerial easement needed. And this is impacts some private property in this area. And there's also a, a road, I think it's between 11th and 10th. Uh, where there's an existing road that connects the two residential streets, that road would have to be closed. The street would have to have a cul-de-sac and it continues uh, south of Davie Boulevard before it ties in. So this is just a summary of costs and I had mentioned these before, uh, but I did want to point out the right of way because it, it gives a different perspective than just a number, you know, as far as dollar value. Uh, so we separate out the alternative at the top uh, the operations and maintenance, uh, we're still working on uh, more specific numbers. We do feel there's more risk with the operations and maintenance of a, uh, of a tunnel. Uh, we don't do a lot of tunnels here in Florida, as, as most people are aware. We do a lot of bridges, and, and we understand what's entailed with the mechanical systems and the bridge tender. Uh, but the total capital costs uh, would be... The corridor cost, like I said, it's 27 miles. So the alternatives take, you know, anywhere from two to three miles. And that's that's the cost that, that you see at the top in order to tie in all the track. Uh, but there'll also be an access fee that's required. Um, a couple other points from a constructability standpoint and, and, and disruption. Uh, bridges are a little bit more 
common. We do a lot of bridges, tunnels, not so much. You have some pictures here from the Port of Miami tunnel. So it's a huge operation in order to make those things operate uh, where they'll be extracting a lot of dirt and so forth. And we estimated, I, I think uh, Mike's team estimated about 65,000 trucks just to remove the dirt that's going to be coming out of that. But we'll still have to deal with all the dewatering operations and what to do with the dirt, uh, depending on different features with it. Um, uh, like I said, operation and maintenance, the, the tunnel has, you know, different control rooms as well as the, the bascule bridge, but, uh, they'll have to have control over the ventilation, uh, systems and, and the maintenance of an underground station, whereas, uh, a bridge, uh, either low level or bascule, low level or mid-level bridge requires the movement and a bridge tender full time, uh, out on the site. So this is just resiliency. I know there's been different concerns that get brought up. Uh, this is Port of Miami Tunnel. Uh, what these are, this is their portals. Uh, they actually have doors that come down uh, in an event so that they can protect that. And, and I know um, New York City had some problems when Sandy came through there. They had to spend a lot of money on repairs. The idea is that we're gonna put, we'll, we'll have to put some resiliency measures in so we don't get put in that situation if something were to occur. Uh, everyone's uh, paying attention to sea level rise now. Uh, so these are just some projections that we would have to try and mitigate and just make provisions for. And, and, and not that everything has to be on day one, but we need to monitor it and plan as we go forward. And then from a traffic analysis standpoint, we've done different analysis and we'll continue to do so. We do anticipate that we'll have three to five uh, BCR trains additional during the peak hours. Uh, the graphic you see to the right here just shows queuing and the red represents when an FEC or a freight train goes through. So the queuing is much worse because they take longer to get through. Uh, we're similar to Brightline. Uh, we, our analysis shows that the queues will clear uh, before another train arrives. So it's, it, you can look at the railroad as a signalized intersection almost, and you're gonna get uh, more cycles in it now with the addition of the, the additional trains that we're talking about. All right. so. Uh, from a conductivity standpoint, I just want to point out that freight's going to remain at grade. Uh, the low level closes Southwest Fifth Street, and it also has that closure I mentioned between 10th and 11th Street on 2nd Avenue. The mid level has no road closures. Um, and this, this actually, this one is uh, for the tunnel. I apologize. But the visual impact of the mid level is that our, our bridge is going to be about 8,000 feet long. And we're going to have about 1,700 feet of walls that help support that bridge, whereas the tunnel will close Southwest 15th Street as well as Northwest 5th Terrace at Sunrise Boulevard. And you won't see it visually until you get to those portals where the right-of-way impacts are. And there is about 2,600 feet between both portals that will have to have a wall that um, you know protects the portal, but then maybe some type of fencing or something so nobody would uh, fall into it. Uh, but we can look at landscaping and that type of stuff to soften it. So this is just a schedule. I think this is the last slide. You know, we are looking to try and get to a decision of some measure, um, you know, in the next couple of months, I think, to see if that's possible to find a consensus of how best to move the project forward. Uh, in order to capitalize on some of the federal funding that's coming out, we want to get into what's called project development with uh, the FTA, and they require us to have an LPA in order to start that process with them. So I, I was... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know, I know that you want, I've seen this, so I, I didn't know that you went through that pretty quick for, it's a lot of information. So um, we can open it up. If you all could use your hand, if you look at me right now, there, oh, I see people have their hand, if you could do that. Um, We'll get started. And James Labrie, I see the other hand. You get to unmute yourself, if you would. And once you have a question, if you would um, unraise your hand, I would appreciate it. So we're yeah. going to have about 15 minutes for questions. So uh, James, go ahead. Okay, I'll be quick. Great presentation. Two questions. Um, the low level bridge would allow 90% of the boat traffic to pass through it, 10% would not pass. But what is the number of boats per day that would be impacted by a low level bridge, even though that bridge will be up 85% of the time? 
Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, the total number of, of, of boats that we're estimating that could be impacted, and, and uh, Mike Siskar can correct me if I mess up, is, is about 39, 40 boats total in a day. Uh, out of those, we would expect um, potentially 10% or so to be impacted by it, meaning that they would have to stop. The other thing I want to point out for, for the low-level, mid-level bridge is that uh, the current bridge, the FEC freight line bridge, is, is required to be open 10 minutes of every hour on a schedule. So we would anticipate we'd be required to follow suit and be open on some type of schedule. This way the larger boats can plan accordingly um, for those openings, knowing that it's going to be open for a full 10 minutes at a time every hour and they'll know exactly when it's going to be open. So Phil, if I understood you correctly, you're saying 10%. So that's around four boats per day. Four yeah, boat it, captains would have a problem per day. Potentially, potentially. So uh, two again, and a half billion kind of... dollars for four boat captains. Okay, okay. well. Moving okay, on, so... next question. What are the, res what are the uh, uh, resiliency costs for the tunnel? Uh, we haven't estimated those. I know with the uh, Port of Miami tunnel, uh, I think they had about 25 million to 50 million in their portals as far as the doors. We don't know exactly what will be required to do just yet. So we don't have those numbers as far as what that would be. Um, so that's an unknown still. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James. And now, um, Donna, you're next, if you'd unmute yourself. Michael, okay, thank you very much. You get ready. Um, th this is the third time I've seen the presentation. I learn something new every time. Um, I have a couple observations and two questions. Uh, number one, I believe there's a historic property at the intersection of Andrews and Forth um, that seems, uh, you know, destroying that would kind of contradict a lot of the efforts to protect historic properties and one of the uh, guiding principles of the council. Uh, number two, the cost of the tunnel, in addition to the thing um, that was just brought up about uh, some kind of closure, I don't believe any of the landscaping a la the La Solis uh, tunnel park issue. So I think that number is quite short. Um, and thirdly, just as a point of reference, there should be no additional impact on boats because all boats are now waiting on the river for 50 minutes of every 60 minute period. So there's no reason the bridge, the new bridge couldn't be coordinated to the freight bridge. And then my question is, why wasn't there an evaluation of elevation of all 27 miles of track which could have brought this area into the safety equivalency of other states with high density railroad crossings. It seems to me that what probably will be three plus billion dollars for a tunnel to address six blocks of 27 miles is a little counterintuitive. Could you tell me why that wasn't a consideration in the in the project planning or project comparison? Thank you. Okay, I, I don't know if I captured all of those. Uh, I know some were more statements than questions, but I do want to point out, um, you know, as far as the cost of the tunnel, we've gone through different peer reviews, and 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 I, I recognize what you're saying regarding you know, what are the add-ons and so forth. So we do have some people saying that it's going to be too low and it should be higher, uh, but we have gone through peer reviews, but we are seeing uh, a lot of increase in costs just now, you know, as uh, over the last six months on, on pricing. And, and that would be true for 
any of the alternatives uh, uh, as we move forward. So it's definitely something that we need to be aware of. Uh, the historic property that you pointed out, I'm not sure, are you talking about the old train station on Progresso or I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I just wanna make sure I know the address so I can follow up with the team. Um, I, I can't give you the address, but I could, uh, I could email it to you. Okay, um, that'd be fine. Tomorrow, but it's, it's a, a long building that runs uh, perpendicular to the tracks at 4th and runs along 4th. All right, we, we can, okay. for, we'll, we'll get that to, to you. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure, you know, our team has that information and so forth. Um, the other item you mentioned regarding the, uh, the navigation, um, the, the Boats don't have to wait the 50 minutes. Uh, the, the bridge will always be open until a train comes. Uh, but there's also a requirement that it has to remain open 10 minutes. They set aside 10 minutes every hour so that uh, everybody can schedule accordingly. And yes, we would anticipate we would correspond that with the FEC freight uh, bridge. The freight bridge, since now it only carries freight, you know, they're only going to have a handful of trains a day on it and and there is benefits uh, uh there will be different arguments about how much of a benefit but there's benefits to navigation with all of these alternatives because uh the current bridge is only four feet off the water so all boats have to stop whenever that goes down and if you the bright line train stay on it people have to stop for the bright line all boats have to stop for the bright line train whereas if they go up onto a higher level bridge uh, they will be able to pass pass through uh, fairly easily. And again, we do about 90% of the boats with the low level are, are smaller than 25 feet. Uh, and then as far as an evaluation on elevating, your, what I gathered from that was basically elevating the entire corridor. So all the stations would be elevated and, and so forth. And, and I don't know if that was looked at. I can look into some of the history, but again, these projects need to be cost feasible uh, or well feasible, but also they have to meet cost effectiveness criteria with FHWA. And that's one of the concerns we have. Uh, you have to look at your ridership and what your costs are, and there's different formulas in order to compete for federal dollars. So um, I don't know if I can say much more than that uh, as far as trying to assess, you know, how to move forward in the best manner uh, and what was done you know, in the past studies, but I, I don't believe they looked at elevating the entire line. I do think uh, the department and, and others look at different grade separations that select intersections, uh, what makes sense, and they can look at separate projects to do grade separations. Um, and I, I don't want to say it's not necessarily for safety, but it's the higher volume intersections and so forth, if it makes sense, particularly when you have a lot of freight. I know in some areas further north, when the freight loads and unloads, they'll be out there for 50 minutes at a time blocked in a, a, an intersection. So uh, that becomes problematic. I don't think we have that down here, at least not that I'm aware of, but uh, it's about everybody trying to move freight, move people uh, in all the directions. And, and I can appreciate the, the benefits of elevating the entire corridor, but I don't think they had looked at that, but I do think that they're open to looking at select intersections and so forth to do evaluations for that. Thank you, thank you Bill. And can I ask people as we go forward with these questions, because we have a time limit, ask a question. If, if, if we all have opinions on this. So I'd be it's best if you just leave your opinions for later and just ask questions. I would appreciate that. Um, so I believe Michael Madvis was next. So Michael, if you'd unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. My question is regarding um, the separation uh, from one side of the uh, right away to the other by either a pedestrian or you know, somebody basically would be able to just traverse that. And the difference being, uh, the question being, is the, what's the difference between the bridge and the tunnel? The tunnel you mentioned had 2,600 feet of the trench uh, combined on the south end and the north together. Uh, so that's a good quarter mile or so on each end that would not be able to be crossed. And you know, obviously in an area um, where we still can't cross. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm just trying to get to the point with the, um, 
bridge come down in a way that would make it easier to cross in those areas. Uh, you know, if we were to you know, develop again on the west side of the tracks as it's beginning to happen, and we wanted to be able to communicate easily without using our automobiles, uh, which would be better, I guess is my question. So Michael, the, the, the grade crossings, which are at streets for the most part, except right at the New River, there's a separate pedestrian crossing. Those are gonna remain intact and all the alternatives except for the low level will cut through uh, Southwest Fifth Street, just south of uh, the river, uh, where that connectivity will have to move to Sixth Street. Um, and then the tunnel, as you pointed out, you know, they're, they're a little bit longer, but we're able to bring that up without impacting the connectivity on the north side, but on the south side, uh, it cuts off Southwest uh, 15th Street. The mid and the, the fixed bridges, uh, they're able to touch down in between those crossings. So our goal was to try and avoid any type of roads that are cut off, but uh, the low level does cut off Southwest 5th Street and the tunnel does cut off uh, Southwest 15th Street further to the south. But, uh, you know, the, the streets that, that are open now will remain open. Uh, and hopefully, you know, with this project and, and with some of the different activities that are going on, they can further improve some of the situations that are currently out there. Thank you. Thank you. And um, according to what I'm looking at, it looks like Abby Laughlin is next. Abby, so if you'd unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary. Um, Phil, what... <laughs> Explain to me about, you know, taking these easements and right of ways. I mean, I, I, I care very much about people's businesses and their property rights, et cetera. What happens if you can't get these um, easements and right of ways? Do you take them by eminent domain? How does it work? Yeah, so, so uh, well, first, somebody's got to decide on, on an LPA, and then we'll work whatever's decided whatever the alternative is uh we'll work to try and minimize and avoid the right away but at some point we're going to need right away and and if the alternative because some of the alternatives don't require any private right away but if the alternative requires private right away and we go through our nepa process so we're we're trying to get to an lpa to start a nepa process to start that environmental study so if we go through that, that NEPA study and at the end of that study, we have a build alternative uh, that's a refined LPA and we compare that to the no build. And if the decision at that point in time, which could be you know, a year and a half from now, is to move forward and we, we, we move forward and we get what's called location design concept acceptance. That means approval of our study and, and acceptance into design. Then we would have the ability to move forward with right away acquisition. And the goal is to negotiate a, a fair settlement with everybody. Everyone should get a fair settlement. Uh, but if that can't be reached, uh, eminent domain is a tool in order to obtain the property. Um, and, and we can have people in touch with the different right away folks, but I know when we go through that process, cause I've done that on different DOT projects, you know, the property owner has full rights. They get uh, their, uh, you know, if they want an engineer, they get that paid for it. An attorney will be paid for uh, expert witnesses and that type of stuff uh, all are paid for by the, the uh, agency that's doing the eminent domain and they will make a fair offer to them and try and negotiate if they can't reach a negotiation in a time a certain time period and they need to ha take possession of the property they'll go to what's called an order of taking so some people may contest what that price is uh, but they may not contest the taking and so the property would transfer the monies that were uh, uh, offered would go into an escrow account where the property owner could draw from it, but they could still argue and go through a process for uh, settlement negotiations and ultimately could go to a jury hearing to, to get a final judgment on that settlement. Great. Thank you. All You're right. Welcome. Thank you. And then um, Earl, I see that you're next if you'll unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just really quick, uh, I had one question um, and one comment, but I just want to say I represent, um, uh, you know, district or a, an area where we have, you know, 10 canals. We, we have mega yachts and we have all kinds of boats that are coming through there. And I've been there in 36 foot and 
it's it's crazy with the tides and and uh, currents and things like that. But the question I had really was, as far as the current bridge, the Baskill Bridge there now, in the mid level configuration, does that get raised up so you have two bridges mid level that would be Baskill and they would be at 25 feet? No, the the existing bridge remains at the the four foot whatever it is. It's around four foot clearance, I think. Uh, that's going to remain in all alternatives. Now we may shift it to the east, uh, but the elevation will remain the same. All right. So I just want to let you. So um, and lastly, will this video do you think be available to be uh, seen by anyone else? This was such a great presentation. Uh, um, I can answer that. This whole meeting um, is being recorded, including this presentation, and it will be on the council's website. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, good. Um, we do have a few more questions. I'm gonna cap it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, we have uh, four more questions and then we're gonna have to stop. And what we'll try to do is answer any other questions we see in the chat, we'll send them on to Phil and get some answers. So- Hey, if I may. Just so everybody knows, I just typed Phil's email in the chat. So if we don't get to you, that's how you can get to Phil. So if you don't okay. see it there, let me know. Thank you. Okay, good. And uh, Leanne, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. I'm sorry I couldn't make last the meeting we had before. But um, I guess there is so much sort of concern about how this, you know, how this whole thing would work and what the, you know, what the, you know, what the tunnel versus, versus bridge and the imagination and all that. Is there any way that, Phil, that you guys could build models, just build, you know, the models to show those three options and then, and then invite us to have a charrette or something so that we could actually physically see them and, um, you know, and make our comments to them? Because I think if you, if you actually physically built little models, it would it would start to become obvious what which ones are issues and which ones aren't. And I like I don't understand how there couldn't be any problem on the north side of the tunnel because it seems like there's going to be there's going to be a the slice going through. But I think we all we are all having a lot of trouble visualizing how this is can be. So that's that's my that's my ask. Okay, so your ask is, can they make models of these things? So yeah. what's the answer there, Phil? Uh, well, uh, I'm sure somebody might be able to make a model. I, I mean, we would uh, prefer to kind of show the renderings because it's a little bit easier lift. Because uh, when you get in the building, you're, you're talking about a physical model, uh, I'm assuming. Is that, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, I think Leanne? we're all really struggling with what this is going to feel like on the on the ground and because you know we i live in flagler village we we walk around a lot so i think i think we're just we're, i think we're all struggling with of trying to imagine how this is going to feel so i, I mean i mean our okay, well, let's let's let him let's let him answer we're we're getting we're really going way over on time so let's yeah, let so, so. Yeah, I would I would suggest if there's certain perspectives uh, that you want to see, like uh, if I'm standing on a certain street looking this way, what what's it look like and that type of thing, and we can try and uh, get a rendering out. Um, but I think the physical models are very tough to do and and may not give you what you think you're going to get from it because they have to be at such a scale that may not be as helpful as you think they will be uh, to do and and. Uh, so I we think have a maybe, number of miles. I think, you know, more renderings is probably a more immediate solution. Be a yeah, I think the perspectives, you know, where, you know, walking on the sidewalk on a certain street or, or, or right up against the Progresso Drive or, you know, those type of things. So we can, uh, you know, try and see what we can put together to, to help people visualize it and, and, and get it, gain a perspective uh, that they're looking for. Okay, great. And then we have two more questions. We're going to go ahead with Melinda. Melinda, you unmute. Your sorry, sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, oh yeah, thanks again for that presentation, Phil. I, I know I've seen this a few times with you as well. I did just want to clarify 
um, again, from my own memory, that the additional number of commuter daily commuter trains, um, in addition to the Brightline trains uh, that are already could max out at 36, would be 55 about. Yeah, I think we're looking at a range of uh, 54 to 60 because sometimes the trains have to come back at the end of the day. So it's not necessarily uh, uh, bringing passengers and that type of stuff. So uh, plus start at the beginning of the day. So I think our, our operations model is looking at 54 to 60. Uh, in the traffic slide I showed you during peak hour, we would anticipate four to five additional trains. Uh, compared to, in addition to whatever Brightline puts through there and whether there's a freight uh, going through. Gotcha. So, so would it, is it fair to say that if, when you take those additional 55 plus a max out of 36 Brightline plus a freight that we would be at about one, we could be at a 100 daily trains? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then just to clarify, the, the width of the... Um, the bridge option um, is. Would you say just from you know uh, side to side, if we if we looked at that, what would be the, the square the foot? Like, is it a, would it be about fifty feet um, east to west if if we did it looked at the bridge? The at the river because at the you know because what happens is you know we have a a bridge that holds the two commuter lines that we're proposing uh, similar to, you know the tunnel has two separate lines and two separate tubes uh, and so we cross the river one way but then we have to widen it out to get to the station and how we address getting to the station north of Broward so at some point Oh uh, yeah, um, so I guess so we'll what separate. I'd be interested so, in is the part not going over the river, the part that actually people would walk under, I guess from east to west, would what would be the dimensions there? And you said it does it does widen a bit. So I'm just thinking, you know, I know that, that the easement has maybe a hundred foot right away, but like from east to west, if that bridge is fifty-six or eighty feet above me, like okay, what's the, okay. what's what's the wingspan? Yeah, so so if you're on a crossroad, right, and you're walking under the bridge, how 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 wide is the bridge above you? Yeah, in encompassing okay. from the the one going each 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 way, kind of the wingspan. Yes. So so it would be about thirty feet. Okay, so thirty feet both so both directions, and and all encompassing, it's well, about thirty feet. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I understand both directions, but uh, yeah, total so, width. So that total width, right? Total, total width, width is 30 feet, which would carry northbound and southbound trains. So it's two tracks on one bridge. Okay, okay, it's so about 30 feet. Thank you. Okay. Magically, there are no more hands raised. I know that somebody. I think Ed put his down. Maybe your his question got answered. So I want to thank um, this team for coming to our meeting tonight. I know that you probably can do some of these presentations in your sleep. Really do appreciate it. We will, um, I do see some questions in the chat that we will probably forward to you. Okay, Phil, um, yeah. next day or so and um, get some answers. So thank you very much. You guys are welcome to stay on the call if you want to, um, but you're, you're excused. And I, again, thank you all for being on our call. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having us. Sorry, sorry, went a little long. No, it's okay. a lot of information. It's, it's a lot. There's a lot. So I can appreciate that you were going pretty fast. So I um, right, thank you. All right, thank you. Going forward, I don't see. Does Bonnie, that... I just wanted to see if you had. Uh, Hello. Anything to see? Up. Okay, see I don't know what's happening there. Um, I do not see our city manager on the call unless somebody else does see him or if he's one of these numbers. No. Sean, I'm here. here. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, there you are. There's your picture. Well, welcome, Chris. Are you able to? Thank you. Are you walking yeah. and talking? I am. I'm walking and talking. And if you hear my teeth chatter, that's because I'm in Washington, D.C. and I didn't have the floor to close for this right. weather. Um, right. And I can't. Uh, promise that you won't hear other people in the background but uh, good evening everybody thank you for having me i'll be fairly brief tonight because 
I don't have the ability to join with you by video um, easily. And uh, I know you're running a little bit long, but it's been a busy, uh, busy month in the city. I'm sure many of you have followed along the actions of the city commission and uh, um, they are taking some progress and, and holding some discussions on a couple of big uh, projects in Fort Lauderdale that always bring attention. Um, Bahia Mar and the One Stop Shop are before them in different uh, meeting formats this uh, next week on the 15th. Um, they also took action in ranking the water plant proposals that we've been talking about for months and we'll see if they move forward with adopting a resolution to move forward with one. Um, it was interesting that they ranked and then that ranking um, passed by a vote of three to two. So it's not by any means um, easy to tell what they'll ultimately do with that item based upon what they've done um, thus far. I can tell you that uh, a couple of the questions that I got prior to today's meeting um, dealt with the noise abatement board, as well as the Kushner development, Kushner properties, those properties that we know on Broward Boulevard, west of the railroad tracks. Um, right there where there's some parking lots. Um, I'll start with that one first and say it's still in pre-development, which means that uh, it's got a long way to go through a development process. Um, there's some question as to what is the number of available units in the downtown rack. All questions for planners to ask as we move that project into the, uh, into the approval process. And with respect to the noise abatement uh, board, um, they sent a communication to the commission asking for uh, the city to hire a noise expert to assist them in their evaluation of our noise ordinance. Um, got some mixed reviews as to whether or not that was the appropriate thing, appropriate thing to do. Um, noise is very complicated and anytime I've had discussions about it, it has taken some sort of an expert in the room to be able to talk about the differences in decibels and weighting and, and other uh, measurement styles. And, uh, you know, we'll, um, we'll see, uh, where that board goes. Ultimately, they'll make a recommendation to the commission for any modifications to the ordinance. Um, but that's typically, you know, a little ways off. I've never had a noise ordinance be reviewed that it reviewed in a couple of months and was, and was done. So um, stand by for further updates as we move through the year and move through the summer on that. Um, from a city perspective, we're obviously, it seems like we get out of the budget cycle for about two months and then we dive right back into it. I have started receiving um, internal requests to look at our next fiscal year budget and how that's going to ultimately come together with a recommendation uh, to the commission. So we can talk about that in coming months. That doesn't necessarily have to be a March thing. And I will tell you, I see uh, Commissioner Sorensen's wife on the call. I can tell you he is alive and well. He is here with me in Washington, D.C. And we uh, were able to attend a reception together in honor of the USS Fort Lauderdale, um, where uh, Secretary Del Toro of the Navy was there to uh, offer comments to the, the first crew that will command that ship. So uh, that's gonna be a very special thing for our city, um, looking towards a summer commissioning and uh, stand by for the date on that. The Navy hasn't released that date yet until they do. We can't say what, what it is, um, but uh, look towards the middle of summer for the, uh, the commissioning of the USS Fort Lauderdale LPD-28. I'm, coming into knowing how it is uh, characterized. Um, so with that, I've taken now probably several minutes. Um, I'll be happy to uh, take a couple of questions if you're so inclined to, to open that up. If you'd rather move on with your meeting, I completely understand. I'm available by email. Uh, well, just a, well, just a few questions, if you don't, if you can manage. If somebody has a question, sure. I'd appreciate if you would raise your hand so I can see. Oh, well, I can see um, Leanne, go ahead, Leanne Barber. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. So, so Chris, we spent, I don't know, six hours on Tuesday a week ago um, about the one stop and came to find out after the meeting that, the, that Alan still had 44 unresolved issues with the contract. So my first question is, where do we stand with the 44 issues and what's the likelihood of them all being resolved in time to have the vote on Tuesday? And then the second question, which is also very critical, is what was the sort, what was their origins of the contract that they were going to be voting on on Tuesday? Because there were some material differences between the contract that was presented for vote and the contract that 
the city attorney was negotiating. Okay. Yeah, so, the, so let me start with the second question and I'll work my way back to the first one. Um, the, the contract that came uh, did come from the city attorney in conjunction with uh, working with lawyers for the proposer. Um, as you recall, he, he did. He worked on that uh, contract from home several days and kept it as a, as a personal working document because every time um, he didn't do that, it would be requested and then it would be out circulating in the community as a, as a draft that really wasn't an accurate draft and then things started to get confusing. So um, probably better to ask him exactly who was involved in that, but I know on behalf of the city, it was the city attorney. Um, a lot of the unresolved issues are honestly decisions that we need or that, that he needs to get guidance from the commission on. And so I don't think that there's ever going to be a point in time that we get to having all differences resolved prior to a contract coming to the agenda. I think that's part of the, the hopes of having it on the agenda is that he can get some, some guidance and some feedback as to where the commission is on certain terms. So um, I never try to predict whether or not they're actually going to vote. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a item in my inbox, I don't know what it says yet, that uh, came in today that deals with an analysis of the one stop. Hopefully I'll be able to read it overnight and see what in fact it says. Um, and uh, I don't have to make the call Thursday morning or not of whether or not it is ready to, uh, to end up back on an agenda for discussion. Thank you, Kay. We're gonna take um, one more question. I know your time is constrained. Um, Ann Hilmer, if you could unmute yourself. And I see, Go ahead, Ann. Go ahead. Hi, Chris. Uh, it's Ann Hilmer. Hey, Ann. Um, hey, Ann. Both the One Stop Shop and Bahia Mar, there were financials that had not been turned in yet, not been given to the city. Um, and those were supposed to come in before the March 15th meeting in enough time to notice the city residents in addition to the city commission. Has any of that stuff come in yet? It has. And it, it has as of this afternoon. I think about four o'clock this afternoon, I approved a memo. Um, to send to the mayor and commission that contain both the appraisal and the financials of the Bahia Bar. I presume it's the, the financials that deal with the one stop that's sitting in my inbox that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, but those went out to the commission uh, earlier today. Happy to share those with the public. I know I've, I've even indicated to some folks I'll be emailing them that tonight, but I'm guessing once I email it out a couple times, it'll circulate its way around. But yes, they're, they're in and the commission has them in their hands and now I just need to find the best way to get it in the community's hands. Okay, if you if you can send it on to me, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. It will publish with the agenda, which will publish on Thursday. But I'm happy okay. to uh, I'm happy to get it out as quick as we can because every 48 hours is 48 hours that we have it that we otherwise would. Okay, just one question, and James, please. Uh oh, you froze. Yeah. Hang on. Uh, if you would, and. And you froze, but I think you're back now. Can you ask that question again? All right, James, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah, you, thank please, you. Please be brief if you would. Sure. Uh, Chris, a couple of weeks ago, there at one of the commission meetings, uh, Commissioner Glassman got pretty upset with Ernst & Young and the cost of doing some uh, work for the city. And uh, they decided to move forward with a different organization. And I was just curious, what did the cost come in dealing with a different group and how much did, uh, was it in this, as comprehensive as the proposal that Ernst & Young had put forward? I guess I could, we'll have to let everybody make their own determination as to whether or not it was as comprehensive. Um, it looked at the proposal uh, for the, the lease itself as well as evaluate market conditions, which was generally what Ernst & Young was doing as well. Um, I don't have a final invoice yet because it was done on a time and material basis, which means it's done based upon hours. Um, my guess is that it will be significantly less than what the Ernst & Young uh, report costs, but I don't know that for a fact, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be you know, quoted on that just yet. Um, that report, that Collier's report that I referred to, that's the one I'm talking about that is received. We did receive it in final form today from Collier's, and we're happy to send it out so that people can take um, a look and then make that decision, uh, that judgment decision on, on their own as to whether or not it's as comprehensive or if it looks at the right things um, for the commission to be able to make a decision. I think it, it did what they asked. Um, and so we'll get it in their hands and see what else they still may need before they can make an educated decision. Okay, and with that, Chris, I'm gonna let you go. I know there's some other hands raised, but 
Um, for the sake of time, we're not going to we're going to tap the uh, questions for you now, so you can get back to uh, somewhere warm inside in Washington D.C. Well, I'm yeah, and it's only it's only going to get colder before it gets warmer um, because uh, there's a, a, a company uh, that is in town. It's actually not in town. It's in Denver um, that deals with tunneling technology. So the first part of your meeting um, was interesting to listen to, um, but uh, we're going to meet with them and talk with them about uh, about the tunneling that they're doing over in the United Kingdom and the methodology that they use. So we're just uh, trying to stay on the cutting edge of tunnel stuff. So uh, I appreciate everybody's time tonight and uh, in, in questions. I will see you all back home where it's warm uh, very soon. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you. Um, Ed, Rebo, it's you keep share, screen sharing. Could you stop doing that, please? And Troy, I'm sorry, if you could put your question in the chat, we can um, ask the city manager later. Okay, there we go. All right, um, we have Dr. JJ next. He's actually not here. He had a family conflict, so he couldn't come here. But we are gonna keep him in a loop, even though COVID seems to be letting, going away for now. Let's keep our fingers crossed that that remains the same. So um, we don't have Dr. JJ tonight. But next we do have um, Anna Sorensen. She's a development consultant for the NSU Art Museum. And she has some fun stuff to talk about for a change. So Anna, if you would go ahead, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Anna Sorensen. I was director of development at the museum for uh, about eight or nine years. Now I'm a development consultant and I'm here to tell you, I had a presentation, but I'm just gonna make this so short and sweet because if anybody knows how good short and sweet is, <laughs> it's, it's someone who's trying to get their kids to bed. So um, I, I just wanna let you guys know that the last Sunday of every month, if, if you guys don't know, is free Fort Lauderdale Neighbor Day at NSU Art Museum. Every resident uh, with a license or a utility bill uh, is free, has free admission from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. We have a brand new Keith Haring exhibition on view. We would love to have you for Neighbor Day. And a feature of Neighbor Day, and I will type this into the chat, is the Neighborhood of the Month feature. And what this means is that every month we choose two or three neighborhoods. We're not gonna do it in March. We're gonna start again in April. Um, to have a meetup and we what that means is we uh, section off a special area of the breezeway we do a tour everybody gets a goodie bag with return passes and it's our way of saying thank you uh, for supporting your museum and for coming to the museum um, that free fort lauderdale neighbor day is the last sunday of every month count on it get it on your calendar the next free day is free first thursday now that every month free first thursday at the museum Admission is free all day and into the evening until 7 p.m. So we really hope that you'll come by and visit the museum. I've got a, a presentation here with all the upcoming exhibitions. Perhaps I'll just send that to Mary. Um, and you can also go to the museum website. So thank you so much. I'll put my info in the chat. And if you'd like to sign up your neighborhood for uh, Neighborhood of the Month, please do. Please do, we'd love to have you. Thank, thank you, Anna. And for those of you that have never been to the museum, you should go. And uh, it's a great place and they have wonderful exhibits. And um, I'm kind of an art museum freak myself, dragging my husband to all these museums where I am right now. So thank you, Anna. And uh, we'll certainly get the word out. If you can see the presentation, maybe we can put it on our website also. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. All right, and then moving on, we have Janetta. She's a Maxina. She's a senior management fellow, um, and in neighborhood support. And she's got a, I think she's on here, a brief presentation on a neighborhood recognition program, which most of you should be aware of, but a couple of you might not have seen it before. So, is Janetta on here? Yes, Mary, I am here. Are, okay, thank good. you so much for having me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I don't know if Jim, do you have her presentation? He does not. Let's see. Um, I believe that I'm able to share. Are you all you able okay. to You're see good. it? You're good. Okay. So I am so happy to be here tonight to share with you all about the, our city of Fort Lauderdale's neighborhood recognition program. Um, every year, um, we ask that um, neighborhood associations um, partake in the application process, and it is totally free. 
um, the purpose of which is to is to give neighborhood associations a voice. You strengthen your voice within the community, um, and you can also mobilize communication with the city, um, especially through neighbor support. Um, you know, we are there for those commission priorities. We are there for our neighbors, for what you need. Um, we're there to um, ensure that whatever you need from the city, no matter where in the city, that we're able to connect you. Um, so the neighborhood recognition program is extremely important. Um, it is available on the city of Fort Lauderdale's website. Um, which we've had some updates to our website is kind of new. It looks a little bit different, but this is how the page looks. Um, I would certainly prefer um, that um, associations um, apply through the online application, but I understand if that is not possible. And if you need to mail in your application, um, I've gotten a few mailed in applications and they will be processed just like the online applications. Um, I want to discuss a few benefits with um, having uh, or with have being recognized with the city of Fort Lauderdale. Um, you get a link on our city of Fort Lauderdale's website. Um, you get your information posted on our website. So the president email address, um, when your organization meets. Um, this is so that other neighbors and other people in your community can also see it. Um, you become a qualified voting member. Uh, well, you can uh, be a qualified voting member with CFLCA, of course. You get one parking permit. Um, you get 500 NCIP points. You get um, green your routine points with our um, public works um, department. Um, and you can also utilize meeting space within city facilities. Um, the benefits go beyond. Um, I would like to say that there was something that happened a few months ago um, where um, we had some neighbors who, um, who may or may not have been um, city of Fort Lauderdale residents. They may have been in an unincorporated area. Um, if you have bylaws, if you have your uh, recognition application updated, we can easily check that data to ensure that the resident or the neighbor actually lives within city lines like those bylaws are so vital and so important um, to our organization and also for your association um, to go further the application i am your main contact person janetta maxena um, my number 954-828-3048 um, so uh, if you need anything but when you submit the application, it's going to ask you a ton of information. The president, not a ton of information, but it's going to ask you your president's name, well, who's the next contact person, it may be your VP, um, it may be your, um, your secretary. Um, we need those bylaws, your association meeting times, um, a copy of your latest um, meeting minutes. Um, any website or email address associated with your association. And it's very important to let us know three issues that are of concern to your association. Um, then we can put together these issues and let um, other um, staff people within the city know of the issues that you are having. Um, last year, we were able to get a lot of applications in, um, and we only had a goal of 60%, and we, we actually reached our goal. Um, I, I would like to increase that goal to 65% this year. Um, currently have less than 30 applications in. It, usually, each year, the applications are due on March 1st. We are extending that deadline to March 15th. Please get your application in. Um, 
and uh, we we also we need your help. Um, spread your word, spread the word about the neighborhood association, the neighborhood recognition program. Um, make any phone calls or emails to HOA presidents. Um, you probably been, have been getting emails. You've probably been getting some phone calls from me and some other folks in neighbor support. Um, you know, help us out. Let people know, hey, it's time to turn in your application. Um, if you're familiar with the city's website, maybe help the other neighbor who's not familiar. Or um, So, you know, we would definitely appreciate that. I will take some questions towards the end of the presentation. I'm almost done. Um, so I just wanted to lay mention of um, neighborhoods that were recognized again in 2021. We had quite a few, um, um, but we would like to continue our initiative in getting um, the same number or more um, neighborhood associations recognized this year as well. Um, and I, I want to end by saying that I know that there are some new presidents, um, some new information that you would like to have up on the website. And that is another reason why the neighborhood recognition program is very important, is to get those applications in. Um, the applications again are due on March the 15th. Um, so after March the 15th, when I get all those applications, I can update staff with the new information about new presidents um new email addresses and i can also update the website um and i am the person who is updating all this information and i'm also your liaison so i'm here for any questions that you may have um and i'll take some questions uh, at this time thank you so much a good thing is and we're going to dovetail right into that is we're also um in the starting our or we're in the middle of our uh, membership uh, renewal also. So we can, you know, certainly I, I'm, I'm feeling kind of bad because I don't think Coral Ridge has done theirs either. And I, I don't know why that's on me, but um, it's not that hard to do. It doesn't take that much time. And um, as we're asking people to do their online um, uh, application for the council, we can certainly dovetail the uh, neighborhood recognition program in with it. So thank you so much, Mary. Okay, Mary, there's some questions in the chat regarding this. Okay, let's see. I see Christina put the link to it. Uh, Leanne wants to know, how do we know if our application was approved? So um, I will send up, I will send a um, follow-up email saying your application was approved. Thank you for submitting it. Um, and I will also like to add please make sure that you add your minutes and the most important piece, your bylaws. If you submit an application with your bylaws, I, will I, can't, um, I can't approve that for, for being a recognized neighborhood association. It's very important. If you need some help with your bylaws, please let me know. J Maxena, J-M-A-X-E-N-A -E at fortlauderdale.gov. Um, and I will easily send you a template of some bylaws and you'll, you know, put your own information in because those are very important. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't see any other. Oh, maybe hang on for a second. Oh, well, the new parking pass for City Hall be mailed before the 2021 permit expires. We did all have parking passes. So we could park there and um, so you know, the, the 2021 parking permit doesn't expire until the 31st of the month um after all the applications get in on the 15th i will be working through and sending those out and i am um i'm i'm almost certain that um you will have your parking passes before they expire uh, whether you can come in and get them or whether we will uh, mail them out to you. But I'm fairly certain that I'll be able to get them in on time to you. Yes. Well, that doesn't inspire people to get their, their neighborhood into your program to get their free parking pass. I don't know what will. You know, so 
um, that's a good inspiration. I always like having that for my dashboard just in case I got to run in there. So, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Janetta. We really appreciate it. And um, I really do appreciate all the help that you've given me the last few weeks. I'm getting in some of these uh, festivals and printing and stuff. So thank you very much. I'm uh, always here to help. Thank you so much for having me, Mary. Thank you, Council. Thanks, Janetta. And with that, then we're going to go right on into uh, Christina Curry, our first Vice President talking about uh, the membership application and dues. So go ahead, Christina. Hi, so I'm going to keep this short. What I just need everybody to know is that I need you all to renew. Uh, you can do it online. You can pay online. If you have a question about your payment, our treasurer is Melinda Bowker. And you also need to update your forms so that we know who is authorized to vote and who is not. Um, I'll put the website in the chat and I'll hand it back over to you, Mary. Thank you. Okay, very good. So we tried to make it easier with everything being online. Um, I think it's easier. So hopefully it is for everybody else. All right, that, that concludes the uh, speaker portion of our meeting. So now we're gonna go on to council business. And if you're looking at the agenda, um, the next, our, we only have really two things on here. Well, we have a couple other things to approve, but um, a discussion ensued at the last general meeting about the Broward commuter rail project, basically tunnel or bridge. Um, so, I think with that, does anybody have any questions or any discussion or not? Does anybody want to make a motion? Should the council uh, actually take a stance on this and uh, or or not? And if they do, what should it be? So I see Melinda has her hand up. So Melinda, go ahead. Uh, let's see, did I unmute? Yes. Yeah. Apologies. Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm all for discussion, um, but I know we've gotten a lot of information. So in order to facilitate this being a, a full discussion, I do want to make a motion that the council membership here vote as city and neighborhood stakeholders and stewards to support the tunnel as the locally preferred alternative for the proposed Brower commuter rails passage, uh, both under the new river and through the downtown corridor and that the council board would prepare a letter stating this position that would be made public record and sent to the Broward County Commission and the city of Fort Lauderdale mayor and commission. Christina Curry, I'm gonna second Melinda Bowker's motion. Thank you. All right, is there, hang on for a minute. Any questions or concerns? Just take a look at this. Okay. Um, hey, Jim, could you take the um, the uh, minutes down just for a minute so I could see the, everybody, the, the screens? Um, and Bill Brown, I see you have your hand up. If you want to unmute yourself, go ahead. Uh, just uh, I'd like to point out, I don't, for the ones that might not be aware, the city commission has already passed a resolution that the city of Fort Lauderdale and the commission is in favor of the tunnel proposal and has such has done so by that resolution having been sent to the uh, county commissioners already. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Leanne. Yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll just make this comment. I, you know, I've already stated publicly that we would prefer the, the tunnel option, but I do say when, when we've talked about it several times, to me, there is not enough information to truly see what, the, what it's gonna be like, what it's gonna feel like, what the impact's gonna be. So I'll, I'll reiterate my previous uh, request that we get some better way of imagining how this is really gonna be impacted. And, and, and furthermore, one other comment, and that was, I have heard, I heard some rumor from somebody that there's a move under underway to relocate the freight line west as well. So it just seems like there's a lot of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unanswered questions for a giant decision to be made. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, 
let me have Troy go since I didn't let him talk before. Troy, go ahead. That's okay. I, I so we're, so just so I'm clear, we're voting on supporting the rail program to proceed based on that presentation. Um. I want to say just based on that presentation, unless that's the first time you've seen it, then it would be based on that presentation. It's not. Okay. So, well, I'll just make the comment that they gave this presentation to our neighborhood at our last meeting, and there was a lot of concern. It goes right through our neighborhood. It, it's a lot of disruption, and no one could identify like what spending all that money would do us any good. It like just makes a few stops in the county and spends a whole lot of money and really doesn't, they, they couldn't justify the ridership um, and its success. And it just, at least in my neighborhood, um, didn't get, uh, uh, didn't receive support, at least not at this point for what they're able to share. Okay, thank you, Troy. And um, Earl? Uh, yeah, just really quick, kind of to second that, um, I've got a mixed group in my area and, you know, I have a big boating community and they're looking for a little bit more information. I, I think there's no doubt they would like the tunnel, but when you look at the impact of when that comes up and all the properties and takes and businesses being wiped out, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm still a little bit, I'm not able to give you a complete 100% vote yet without my folks um, coming back. I think maybe one more meeting I'd be good, but I'm just telling you that's kind of where I'm at. Um, you know what, you can always abstain. Okay. Um, and then uh, Melinda. Oh, uh, yeah, apologies. Um... Yeah, so I just, I did want to, since I made the motion, I, this is the discussion portion, which is obviously very important. So I did just want to make a few comments for those members uh, who are on the fence or maybe um, just wanting to understand what this motion is about. And I guess, um, first of all, I just want to say that um, I think it's very important that the membership um, do this vote tonight. I do know that uh, more information, it would be great to have more information. Um, however, I do think that the county commission will be asked to vote on this in the next six to eight weeks. And I would want our membership's position to be firm. Um, we are not actually being asked on really the analysis of the ridership and the legitimacy of the entire Broward commuter rail project. What we're being asked for is if it were to go ahead, and it seems like it is very likely that 55 more trains will be passing through downtown daily, what would conceptually be our preference as a city and as stewards? And so that is what the conceptual um, question is for us to answer tonight. Um, there will certainly be experts and many others who will be working through the details and the costs. But I do think that um, for me, um, it is um, imperative that this is a legacy project. It will impact generations to come. Um, people will look at this in a hundred years if it's a tunnel and be thankful just as we look at the Henry Kenny tunnel right now, which actually opened 62 years ago. Um, I think that it's a monumental decision the noise, the social separation that would come from our bridge, um, the deterioration of our historic campus and our beautiful river walk, um, not to mention just having something at, like I-95 running through the middle of um, a growing downtown, um, I think makes it imperative that we take this vote tonight. Thank you. Okay, and um, Christina. I just want to share with my colleagues here that I think we've all had ample time to get ourselves and our boards educated to take a position and the Rio Vista Civic Association took a position in October of 2021 um, issuing a statement to our elected officials and FDOT um, preferring a tunnel over a bridge if the this were to move forward. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, James Labrie. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say a few comments here. Um, first of all, I live in Poinsettia Heights in the northeast section of town, and I'm just east of 15th Avenue. And every day, 
I cross the tracks at 13th Street or 17th Court or 24th or 26th or uh, Oakland Park Boulevard or commercial. Every day I go back and forth across as do thousands of other cars. And yet there's no mitigation for the impact that this train is going to be causing to the drivers. We just have to, it seems, accept it. However, we're talking about spending two and a half billion dollars because it, a, a low level bridge might inconvenience four to 10 boat captains a day who already deal with traffic on the river. They have boats, they have bridges, they know when they're gonna be open, they know when they're gonna be closed. It doesn't make sense to me to spend all that money for very little gain, making some boat captains happy, when yet thousands and thousands of drivers are going to be impacted by the problems caused by these trains go on the east and west roads, by these trains crossing through those. Thank you. Thank you. And, um... Okay, we got lots of hands up, people. It's eight o'clock where you are. That's all I can say is um, if you could just keep your comments brief, everybody would really appreciate it. So, um, with oh, Marilyn, put her hand down. Thank oh, Marilyn. Luna. Yes. No, 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 I did not. I did not. I didn't know oh, what no, happened. All right, all right, go ahead. I just want to say, um, uh, with respect, Melinda, uh, you think you say that this um, um, motion is to is uh, supporting a tunnel versus a bridge in principle assuming we're going to be getting this project one one way or the other that's not the way i read that uh, your motion your motion is uh, a positive we prefer a bridge over a tunnel having said that i must say that the a tunnel over City, bridge um, me, Maryland, tunnel over the bridge yes yes tunnel <laughs> over the bridge okay but i must say also that the harvard civic association had this same presentation and my organization, my civic association, voted in favor of a, uh, a bridge versus a tunnel based uh, entirely on the fact that they did not feel it was reasonable to spend that much money on uh, that alternative that the money could be better spent in other ways. So I, I would have to vote no on this because my organization uh, uh, took a position. All right, thank you. And uh, Donna, and again, everybody, please keep your comments brief. Go ahead, Donna. Uh, I, my organization um, raised a list of points. Number one, safety. Uh, number two, safety because of the increased traffic everywhere but on the tunnel or bridge portion. East-West congestion not being addressed. And the cost. Um, we are a Western middle-class neighborhood many people struggle to keep their housing affordable for them. It's a price tag they can't abide. And I'm just going down the line here, um, Ed Rewitz, go ahead, Reholtz, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ed. I was under the impression that the mayor had a lower cost for the tunnel somewhat under a, a billion dollars. Has that been changed or I miss hear, hear something? Well, to my knowledge, that um, is an Elon, Elon Musk tunnel. And I don't know that that has gone away or that they've actually given a proposal formally. So mm -hmm. to my knowledge, that is still out there. The cost that you're looking at in this presentation, again, to my understanding, um, would be for a traditional tunnel that the Florida Department of Transportation anticipates. They don't think they- when, um, when the mayor, mayor said there's actually, it was two vendors under a billion dollars. So I'm not sure where that is now. And that substantially changes the picture, uh, makes it closer. The other thing is all those raising those rails, it really puts a wall through the, the city separates the city. You know, if we have a tunnel that is close to the, the bridges, I'd rather have the tunnel than the, than the bridge. Okay, thank you. And uh, Tara Chadwick, go ahead, Tara. Um, I have a question about how, because um, 
like I want to know how the votes are counted like because when we had this presentation last week at our civic association meeting um the majority of our residents felt like they did not have like they it was their first time it was like for everybody except me it was their very first time receiving the information and it was like the two and a half version our version even though we asked for the 30 minute version and so it was a lot of information and people felt like they didn't have enough information or at least not enough understanding of the information in order to be able to um make a decision for our community at that time so therefore i'm going to vote to abstain more than likely, but you know that's what I was instructed to do. <laughs> but I do want to know before I, you know, before I make that decision, what like how are the abstention votes going to be counted within our quorum? You know, like is it just going to be a majority, or you know, is it going to be based on you know, like so you so if we abstain, is that like not voting at all? That's what I want to know. Well, to abstain is really not voting at all. Correct. So, so what I'm hearing you say is you really don't have a consensus from your own civic association. So you can't really vote in either direction. Well, honestly, this is what happened. Um, slightly more than half of the people said we don't have enough information because I told them that we were going to have to, you know, that I was going to have to make this vote on behalf of everybody. And they said we don't have enough information in order to, you know, vote. And there were two people um that felt like they really liked the tunnel you know and and but but the the majority of people felt like they just needed more time and more information maybe a presentation from you know someone else like we heard you know that the mayor might have different information and so i don't know if that could be an amendment like if we could just take this vote at the very next meeting or if that's going to be too late but those are some of the concerns that i had or questions before we make yeah. them. well actually christina just put in the chat per our bylaws oops christina you want to say that out loud? <laughs> i guess she didn't hear me she says per our bylaws for tonight Action shall require an affirmative vote of a majority of the voting members in good standing in attendance. So to answer your question, to abstain would not, would be just a not a vote. So it wouldn't help in either direction. That's, that's not, but that's not how I understood what she just said though. I, I, were you in need of majority of all of I the can clarify. I can okay. clarify. Okay, so our bylaws are published on our website and you can see under section two, it has our guidelines. So in order for us to have action, we need an affirmative vote of the majority of the voting members in good standing that are present. So today, when we went through our roll call at the beginning and made sure who we had who was authorized to vote, we had 24. So we would need an affirmative vote of the majority of that number. And that's right in our awesome. bylaws. Okay, Thanks. that's great. That That's super clear. Thank you so much. Okay, two more hands and that's gonna be it. Um, Jana, Jana Gray, Jana Gray Williams, sorry. Jana, if you could unmute yourself. There you go. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. My apology, I had a tooth pull, so you all please forgive me. I just, just be brief. That would be great. Well, first, I want to say I feel disrespected tonight. Um, and I have to say this because I've been dealing with civic association for a number of years. And and I have to say that lately, whenever I give my my comments in the chat or whenever I have something to say that I've been overlooked and we're talking about we're talking about building a bridge to divide our neighborhoods. And we're talking about a fight over whether to go overhead to divide our neighborhoods further or to go underneath with a tunnel. If we can't get just commonality and inclusion and common respect for every voice on this call that's representing every single district and every single neighborhood, then what's all this for anyway? That's first. Secondly, 
our community, River Garden, Sweden Estates, have not received the video presentation that we received tonight. That's second. Our community um, meets quarterly, so we have not seen the presentation. And as a result, I know I'm not able to vote. I will ask the, the, the person who made the initial um, request, um, the person who made the, mot the motion, if the motion maker would, uh, would take this opportunity to either um, extend the vote to the next meeting so that everyone will have the same opportunity that all of you all have already had in receiving the presentation because it's not fair that they have singled out who to go and visit with this presentation and have left others out. That's unacceptable. They need to do their due diligence and make sure that if they want our vote, they're going to have to work for it. Okay. Okay, Jen, I, I really feel bad that you feel disrespected. I'm, I'm going back to the chat and I apologize. It's kind of hard to run these meetings and get everybody's uh, question. I do see that I missed uh, questions you had. Uh, it was pretty, you know, I, I do see that I missed your question. So I do apologize for that. I'm just not as good at multitasking as I should be. So I do apologize. It's okay, Mary. I love you anyway, sis. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody know Somebody that I'm not, I'm not a person. I am not a person for drama or dysfunction. I am the sweetest person you will ever meet. I got that from my mother, Miss Juanita Gray. So right. I, I, know. I, I just want to say bad, so. thank you all. all. Right. Even, even though I personally prefer myself the tunnel, but I have to be a representation of the collective body. So please make them do their due diligence and meet every community since they want and need our vote. Okay. And also, Jana, just on the council's website, um, we did put a, um, these, these presentations actually are on there, although the guys aren't talking, but you can always share them with your neighborhood. Too. They're on our website and you can just provide a link and if you need any help doing that, let me know. Okay. Because it's really pretty much the same presentation. All right. And, and Mary, I have a question. If and even though I'm representing historic Deutsche River Bend, if you I got the email and I know I'm representing um on behalf of uh Pamela um Beasley Pittman. So if you get the emails as a registrant, aren't you also getting the same emails? Because I got the present of uh, the information that was sent out to read the, the proposal. So I'm just wondering, it just doesn't go to the presidents. It goes for anyone who gets, who signs up to attend the meetings, correct or no? Um, if you're in our, it, it, that, that presentation when, you know, or that um, email that went out that highlighted all the presentations, that's what you're talking about. Right, right. Yeah, that went to about 400 different people. All right. People. So it would occur, certainly go to the president, to all, and the representative, and then many other people, maybe the past president, maybe the past representative, just to everybody to try to get oh, as, yeah, trying to vote. as possible. So that's okay. That's you know, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to respond to, you know, anyone who's on here because when I got it, I appreciated it and I did read it. So, okay. um, well, and dis know. discussed it with um, historic. So I'm just, you know, and that presentation by the county, that is something we have to reach out to the county to ask them to come to your neighborhood, correct? Um, That's what I-, I know, But I, if you want them to come to your neighborhood, just get a hold of me, I'll tell you how, to, I'll, I'll give you the person to get- Right, I, 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 oh, thanks. But I'm just trying to say that that wasn't a presentation that you can, that was from the county. So, Correct. It, right. right, okay. It's not right. from the city, it was from the county. Okay, Correct. thanks. I reached Correct. out to FDOT. It was um, the, the FDOT guy, the guy that was presenting to us. And I said, we need this information at our civic association because if I send around slides, nobody's gonna read them. And so he, they came and they, they, are, is, they do have a paid employee that's being paid to do outreach. So they should be outreaching to each of us. And if they're Correct. not, call them and ask them. That's okay. right. All right, thank you. And then, okay, um, Jim Brady, go ahead. Thank you for your patience. Yes, uh, 
Are we on? Yes, yes. you're on. Oh, but you, you muted yourself. Jim, you got to unmute yourself. You accidentally muted yourself. I unmute him. Jim, you have to unmute yourself. Oh. I, there you I'm, go. I'm tech stupid, Mary. So, uh, <laughs> it's anyway, all right. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, the Coley Hammock Association votes in favor of the tunnel. Uh, and we want to thank you for your leadership. And I want to personally thank Marilyn for her continuing uh, leadership in various areas. Uh, but to everyone, you know, we join to make a better community all the time for everyone. Thank you. Jim and Melinda. Um. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Mary. I did just want to comment um, just because Janae um, did did mention me um, and I did want to make one thing on costs. Um, and Janae, I apologize. I did not see your your um, question in the chat. Um, I, I I am not going to um, try to defer or resend my motion. It's got a second and I'm going to let this play out. I do want the membership to remember as well that um, there, this was an agenda item at the last meeting. Um, the uh, Broward Commuter Rail and New River Crossing it was first on the agenda with the Mayor Trantalis actually giving a fairly lengthy explanation of the matter at hand. I also want to let people know that this is not a City of Fort Lauderdale project where we're going to be solely taxed and pay for this. This is, as you probably remember from the presentation, but it takes a few times to get it. 50% uh, funding is expected from the federal government, 25% from yeah, you the saw state. That, so we're voted for it. And the other 25% yes. would be from local municipalities. But as um, you know, we did pay for penny tax um, for Broward County, and we are expecting uh, probably uh, greater revenues from that than expected. So I just didn't want people to think as far as the money that this is just a city of Fort Lauderdale um, issue. There are multiple funding sources and there are also financing options outside the traditional federal and state funding methodology that uh, Broward County and the MPO would be pursuing on our behalf. So just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. All right. And with that, because we do have a motion that has been seconded and we've had discussion, we are going to go ahead and vote and we're going to vote by roll call, if that's the correct way to say it. So to my understanding, Christina, I'm gonna let you go ahead and just say how you're gonna do this. We, we're trying to do this a little bit better than the last time we were not prepared to have a vote by- uh, Okay, all right, thanks, Mary. So um, we're gonna to call to question now. So what I'm gonna do is everybody who told me that their association was here in the beginning, I'm gonna call down through each of those associations and then you can tell me if you're supporting Melinda's vote or if you're opposing it or if you'd rather abstain. At the end, I'll ask anybody if I miss their association and then if I have you on the list as a designated rep or alt, then we'll go ahead and add it up. So just bear with us and please don't put anything in the chat because if I'm looking down at my list, I can't see it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm going to start with Coley Hammock. Mute. Jim Brady, you're on mute. I need you to unmute, Jim Brady. I think it was Jim a Brady. yes. Unmute yourself. You got to unmute yourself. No, I got to hear it. Okay. Jim Brady, do you support the motion? Can you give me a thumbs up if you support Melinda's motion? We are in favor of the tunnel. So okay. you support Melinda's motion. Thank you. Coral Ridge Association. Um, you support the motion. I support the motion. Thank you. Coral Ridge Isles HOA, do you support the motion? I do. Croissant Park Civic Association, do you support the motion? Croissant Park, going once, going twice, Croissant Park. Michelle, you were here. 
All right, downtown Fort Lauderdale, Melinda, did everybody convince you not to support your own motion? <laughs> I, I am voting yes on this motion as did uh, my board. Thank you. All right, Edgewood Civic Association. Flagler Village, do you support the motion? Flagler, there's two of you on here. I had Michael Madfis and now I don't see him. Michael, are you there? Michael's gone. How about Miss Barber? We heard you so much. Can we hear you again one more time? Miss Barber, do you support the motion? Yes, we'll vote in support of the motion. Thank you. Gold Mile, do you support the motion? I do. Harberdale, do you support the motion? No, I don't. Historic Dorothy Riverbend, do you support the motion? Yes. Home Beautiful, do you support the motion? I abstain. Idlewild, do you support the motion? We abstain, we've not voted yet. Imperial Point, do you support the motion? I abstain. Lauderdale Beach HOA, do you support the motion? Support. Say that again. Uh, we support the motion, Lauderdale Thank Beach. Thank you. Lauderdale Harbors Improvement Association, do you support the motion? We abstain. Lauderdale Isle Civic Association, do you support the motion? On behalf of our boaters and yachters, we agree. You support the motion. Okay, thank you. Um, Middle River Neighborhood, Colleen? You mean Middle River Terrace, yeah. The designated, sorry, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. The des designated rep for our neighborhood is now at the meeting. So Troy Liggett is, uh, has the vote, not me. Okay, Troy? Uh, and because of traffic issues in the entire project, and the lack of, of community support in our neighborhood, I have to vote no. You do not support the motion, thank you. Uh, Palm Air, do you support the motion? No. Rio Vista supports the motion. Rio uh, River Garden, Sweeting Estate, Jana. Abstain, Christina, and I still love you all, thank I you. I love you too, Jana. Rock <laughs> Island, do you support the motion? Janae. Sorry, Janae, now you hate me again. Rock Island, do you support the motion? Sunrise Intercoastal, do you support the motion? You're muted, Jim. Sorry, abstain, we haven't voted. South Middle River Civic Association, do you support the motion? Going to abstain. We haven't had the presentation um, at our meeting. Victoria Park, do you uh, support the motion? Yes, we support it. Is there any association that has, uh, that's a member with a rep here that I missed? Anybody see anybody? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, I think you're good. Well, Christina, I'm assuming that you're looking at the vote. So while you're doing that, I'm going to, um, Melinda, can you give your treasurer's report? Sure. Um, okay. Uh, do you want me to share it or just? Yeah, that's a good idea. It's always easier. I will uh, share. Sure. I like people to see it. Okay, here we go. Uh, sorry, let me. I've got it, it Melinda, if you want me to do it. I think I got it. Here we go. All right. So um, treasurer's report as of March 8th today, um, we are now officially with Truist. Um, nothing big happened. SunTrust um, is now Truist. So <laughs> um, updated the report in the primary business checking account. We have $11,267. 
on 89 cents on uh, the PayPal account. Um, that account's been going up this month. Thank you for getting those membership payments in. It's 2,550.69 with a total for the council and all accounts of $13,818.58. Um, within the primary uh, business checking balance, um, there are reimbursements for our president and first vice president um, reflected. And um, I will quickly move to just um, now the new fiscal year um, membership payment log, um, which now has uh, 19 um, who are current for our fiscal year ended March 31st, 2023, which is what we're now taking uh, payments for. Um, so please, um, I know what we um, have at least uh, hopefully another uh, 50 more to go. Uh, so please get your payment in. It's, it's very easy to pay on PayPal and uh, fill out your membership form on the, on the website. Um, so I'll take any comments or questions. Do you just wanna go over the reimbursement or the reimbursement total so people know the deduction? Sure, so the, the reimbursement uh, for Christina Curry was $350. And that was um, for the, um, we had um, a, um, I would say a drawing painting done at the Sistrunk um, Parade and Festival. Um, it was beautiful. It's, um, it, DJ, uh, I don't remember his exact name, but I know the artist is uh, D, referred to as DJ. And he did that actually during the parade and festival on site where we had a tent. Um, and then that was donated. Um, so that was 350 uh, reimbursement because Christina paid for that uh, to the artist out of pocket. And then for Mary, um, there were there were multiple expenses. Um, let me just pull them up uh, and I'll give you a quick summary. Um, we had a, um, a uh, gift expense uh, for our outgoing president. A um, couple expenses there. We had our uh, constant constant contact annual fee of $168. Uh, we had our application of $100 for the Strunk Festival. And then we also did our uh, corporate Florida SunBiz filing for $61.25. And the total of all of those uh, reimbursed to Mary Pelliquin was $623.31. Okay, any other questions for Melinda? Good. Great report as always. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. It's very easy to see who's doing what. All right, and Christina, are you still looking at the votes or do you want to- I'm ready. Okay, so ahead. we had 21 associations who just participated in that vote. Seven of those associations abstained, abstained, three said no, and 11 says yes. So uh, we're right there. What do you mean, we're right there? We're 11 out of 21. Oh, Motion, motion passes. Oh. Is it? So you're saying it, it did pass, correct? Sorry. Yeah. That's, a, that's the right number, so. All right. All right, good. All right, well, I will make that happen. And uh, let me just do this real quick. Um, Mary, 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 my connection is in and out. Again? But I want to, I, my connection's in and out, so I couldn't hear what you just said. But you remember when we talked about what the bylaws said, the bylaws said that it is, the majority and a majority is defined as 50 plus one of voting members so we it's 50 percent of the 21 plus one so with 11 we're not there because it's not it's not technical it's oh, not an exact math okay so i misunderstood you so it did not pass no we're a half off because of um, the people that left, we ended up with a different number than when we started. I see one hand up, but yeah. James, we we checked, if this is where you're going with, with your vote, I checked with um, Melinda and 
the last time that we got any information or payment from your association was a year ago. So we don't have an update listing you as an alt or a rep. I can't hear you now. I can't hear him. Can someone else hear him? I can hear him. Yeah. So that's not where I'm going, but I do have a question. How many people are on the call who, for whatever reason, aren't allowed, weren't allowed to vote? Well, the only people that can vote are the representatives of a civic association, and if they're not available, then the alternate. Those are the only of, of, a, of a civic association that's um, a member of the council. Right, but how many, how many organizations? If you, if you give me a second, let me go back to the bylaws, unless my second vice president wants to step in here. But let me go back and look at them again, and we'll revisit this. Okay. Okay. And um, the, the issue here, the issue, Mary, is that I think I'm not the only one who was partic participating on the call tonight, but for whatever technical reason was not allowed to vote. Now, I understand what she's saying in regards to you have to be listed as the official representative, but I took over position back in the November, December timeframe. No one has questioned whether or not. I'm the official representative of my civic association until tonight. So I think the number of people who were representing their association but weren't allowed to vote for whatever that reason was, is an important number for us to know. James, we can't throw the bylaws out the window. That's, that's not the way any of our organizations work. And it's- I'm not asking you to throw anything out. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is, how many people were representing their neighborhoods tonight that you did not call a person to vote? I don't need to keep track of people who vote who are not members of this association. That's not how our bylaws operate and dictate my task. So to get yourself, you, you could have been on the call and nobody knew that you were or you weren't because we didn't have a vote. It wasn't until we started voting that we realized we really had to check who was able to vote and not or not. So we have, I, I don't know exactly why, but we don't have a current application from your civic association listing you as a representative. So if you can go online and do the application and send in the dues, then that makes yourself and whoever your alternate is. Um, Our president said he did it last week. I don't know what happened, Mary. I'm gonna find out. Okay, this is that's pretty what you annoying. Need to do. Okay, that's the problem. All right, and Tara, go ahead. I just was wondering if we could put our, like, are we, can we put this on the agenda to vote again next time? Or does that mean that we can never vote on this again? Because there was seven of us, I believe, that abstained because our associations felt like they didn't have the information ready to vote this time. But um, can we vote again at the next meeting? Well, you know what, let the, the, you know, the board meets, you know, these meetings come around pretty quick, but the board meets again. And, you know, I think we'll have to discuss this as, as a board as to how we manage this and how we, how we do this. So if you would just stay tuned, we'll let you know. I, I, I don't know the answer. Well, yeah, cause it would, cause the thing is it's, it is going to matter a lot in terms of timing because um, like it took a while for me to get the presentation you know like i mean people would have to start planning now to try to get their communities the information and even the way that the information is presented is not necessarily a best practice in getting information out to people <laughs> you know like a, a, a kajillion slides and all that so you know like it if we know that we're going to vote on it again or that it's likely that we're going to vote on it again i think that would propel people propel everyone to try to get as much information as possible. Well, all mm -hmm. somebody has to really do is um, make a motion at the next meeting, just like we had a motion just now. But yeah. it was also on the agenda and we kind of knew at the end of last meeting that this was gonna happen. Yeah, I think we have to let the board, we have to let the board mull this over. I, I, I know what I wanna say, but I really don't wanna, I can't say it. <laughs> Right now, so let's um, okay. the board talk about, and we'll we'll see what the next agenda is, if it's on the next agenda. Okay. Okay. 
All right. In the meantime, um, I do have one more question. Was there another like, uh, was there another set of information that the mayor had? Like, cause like I said, we reached out to Florida Department of Transportation to try to get the information, but I just was wondering if there's alternate information out there, like should we also be reaching out to another entity to get information about this whole proposal? Not to my knowledge. Marilyn. I, I think that's an excellent, excellent suggestion. The mayor has actually put together a presentation from his perspective of how he looks at it and why he thinks it's important to go with the tunnel and, and his take on the numbers. So that, it that's, would probably- We have that, Marilyn, it's, we have that on our website. That's I, I, under, I understand that, but you know, when you have a presentation uh, with, with from one perspective and we seem to have, you know, some, some questions, everybody's got some questions. I just wanted to agree with the lady who said that, you know, Perhaps we should get somebody else with a different perspective. I just wanted to second to her motion. Okay. And Ed? Ed, go ahead. As we've been talking, I pulled up the channel, which is the tunnel under the English Channel. And it talks about it cost them $12 billion to do it in US in dollars now. They, didn't, they paid a lot less than that. If you backtrack that, reduce the size, reduce the number of, of tunnels from three to two, you're really in a ballpark number of 500 million. And that's what the mayor was saying. His number was between five and seven. And to me, that paints a completely different picture of this analysis. All right, well, that concludes that. I wanna, um, I wanna ask, please let me ask this though. Has everybody seen the minutes and are there any corrections to the minutes? No, and the minutes stand as they are. We do not have to vote on the minutes. Um, and I don't see any other hands or anything crazy in the chat other than uh, no, that we're done. So I um, would- Mary, like excuse me, Mary, um, there's still the legislative committee report and I would recommend that we table that to the next meeting since it's almost 10 to nine. Everybody good with that? I, I guess, let's do that. The, the information is posted on the website uh, along with a, uh, a brochure from the, uh, the city. So, and the county. Okay. So I think that there's some information out there we can revisit at the next meeting. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. I did I didn't mean to go over I missed that, but I did miss it. So all right. And so um with that, the longest meeting in the history of man is now adjourned. <laughs> Everybody, good night for all your questions. Welcome to our new people. Make sure you get your applications into us and to the city. Please help Janetta and get um, your neighborhood recognition application. And it's not hard. It takes just a little bit of time. So um, with that, everybody have a great night. I appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Stand Thank you. Down. Good night. Goodbye, Mary. Enjoy your trip. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. I am enjoying it.